All right, I'm going to read the fourth chapter of Ephesians again because I, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but my style or preference is I like to, to marinate in where we're at. So that kind of uh, facilitates uh, repetition, but that's my purpose as far as marinating. So I want to read first and then we'll go into uh, something that I think is phenomenal about uh, this idea of speaking truth. So, chapter 4, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to, with, to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led, host, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. I'm going to start doing this. This is what we do in the military, or the army at least. Air Force doesn't need to do that because they're all smarter than us. No, that's what we're, 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 we're doing this to, to key into certain things, okay? I should have done that from the beginning. Until we all attain to the unity um, of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of this stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into, who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now this I say in testifying the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, to practice every kind of impurity. But this is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have learned about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are, as member, we are members of one another, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone or everyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. So, we get to a whole bunch of those other action words. And uh, it's interesting that now in Ephesians, we have this blatant, well, idea, and I say new idea, not that it's new to us, or it's not even new to Ephesians, but it's brand new in, as far as him using the word, and that word is renew. Be, this idea of being renewed. 
And so I want to talk about that in, in light of this idea of truth speaking. Uh, Jeff and I got, uh, we got together this last week and um, had a good conversation about this. Because again, the, the more I marinate in, in a verse, which is why we can tend to stay in a verse for five weeks at a time, uh, the, the more insights I have to, as to my own understanding of it, my, you know, my own perspective as far as how I experience it. And, and the reason I bring this up is because that, that verse um, where it says in, in verse 15, rather speaking truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body uh, being joined together and held together by every joint with which it, it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Okay, so just in a little bit of the statements that were made last week, and we didn't necessarily dive into, hey, what, how do we understand this idea of speaking the truth? And I, I, I remember somebody bringing up the idea that, hey, that's, that's a hard thing to understand or to, to do, is this idea of speaking the truth in love. So I want to tell you what, what I do think that the emphasis is as it pertains to relationships, okay? Because the tendency can be to think about this idea of speaking the truth in love. It, well, let me ask. Well, I mean, I, I think it was Sydney that said, hey, that, that's it's good, it's a command, but man, that's hard. It's hard to understand, you know, what that looks like or how to do it, I think is, it, that's kind of what I got with what you'd said about that speaking the truth in love. But, and this isn't, it's not a quiz. What, what, what do you guys think of when, when you hear that, that idea, that command, speaking the truth in love, and kind of, why, why does that sound, or why is it hard in our lives? Well, I mean, what do you think? I think that, <clears throat> say, I just think that, since I'm a blunt person, that examining yourself inside yourself and wanting to do the person or whatever the object is, truthfully without a bar or anything to in yourself are you loving that person or that cause or whatever you're talking about I really think that if we're looking try to put your eyes on the Lord and see what he would say and do because in our own selves especially some of us that are more outspoken Things can just blurt out, and they end up, although you might think you're doing it in love, they end up being um, the wrong emphasis and not truly of the Lord. Okay. So you're, you know, just kind of normal. Yeah. What's that? I know I'm rambling. Oh, no, you're not. No, I, I mean, that, that's good. So it's kind of, the way I hear that is it's kind of a, um, you're speaking of general conversation or general living in which... Like you, you said your flavor, you may be more blunt or forthcoming, that you may intend something to be good, or you don't have a negative intent there, but the way you say it, the way it comes across, ends up being, I, I don't know, destructive maybe, but destructive, or harmful. Okay, good. Ryan. Um just what immediately comes to me would be like a brutal honesty, but out of compassion. You're talking about them saying, Speaking speak truth, truth in love. love, okay? So this idea of compassion, okay, we're, we're, good. Like, well, like we, she just said, it, it may not come across as compassionate or out of love, but it's just a brutal part. Okay, good. Yeah, Sydney. Um, another thing I want to say that the scripture says that love co covers a multitude of sins. Lots of times you just, the best thing is to shut up. Because, because you can I say I gotta write that down. <laughs> this is for you, Leonard. <laughs> oh, he's familiar already. <laughs> no, I, I'm just gonna, this is gonna be forever on YouTube. <laughs> 13 views. <laughs> okay, go ahead, keep going. Well, it's to be quiet because lots of times you can share something and you might even think, I'm going to share this as a prayer request with somebody. But actually, you're sharing it and it's not covering up what should be covered. And the Lord can take care of that thing that should be covered and not you. Okay.
Okay. Ollie, you had your hand up. Because also on the other hand, it's also those conversations that are hard to have that you don't even necessarily want to get into because you're worried that it's going to hurt somebody being able to do that and do it lovingly, where it's not hey, you know, I'm not sure how to necessarily approach the subject, but I know that this needs to be addressed because if it's not, then somebody, you know, that it is going to continue to be, um, leave something that's going to hurt somebody. So having those hard conversations, but doing it in a loving manner It's like prancing through a minefield. Pretty you know? much, yeah. Not only could get any smaller in that painting, only you could read it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's part of it is I'm writing some notes that I'm, I'm just hearing. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that I, I want to bring up. Yeah. Uh, there's something came to what Sydney said um, that I think he needs to shut up. Karen reminds me of something my mom would always tell me is once you say it, you can't take it back, it's always, it's always there. So. Okay. Okay, good, yeah. So I was thinking about even like what love means, like what love is, so thinking about the good of the other person, or sometimes when we speak the truth to someone, we're really thinking about ourselves. <laughs> so I'm gonna tell them this because that will hopefully you know, result in something good for me, but sort of that motive of I actually want what's best for you, and even being willing to take a risk that you might get angry with me or not understand or whatever, but that I believe that saying this to you is, is going to help you or... Okay, yeah, good. Well, this is pretty much what, um, what's been said, but also I think a lot of times we have to listen what people bring to us in order to give people what we want them to hear. So sometimes people come to us and tell us what's wrong with us. It's not just about telling other people what's wrong with them or trying to fix them. People are trying to fix us. So we have to internalize that as love too and maybe not be so critical. If we're not critical of, of people, that, that kind of bridges that understanding of how it's being, how we're communicating with one another and that it's not self-serving because I think a lot of times, I don't know, like what Joe was saying is that our, we have, we tell people what's best for them, and it really is more self-serving than <clears throat> self-love, than loving the other person. Okay, good. So seeing to that, like, um, we don't ourselves have it all figured out. <laughs> say what, say it again. We don't ourselves have it all figured <clears throat> out, you know, so that having that. Real easy to say. Humble attitude. Uh, okay, good. Jack. So I think there also needs to be a relationship there, because any time... We are never righteous enough to tell somebody else how to live their life, right? So I think there has to be that relationship there where you're both in growth. Short of that, I think it's very difficult to um, bring up something that bothers you and another person, or even a sin in another person, because there's no absence of sin in my own life. And so until there's a relationship between you, um, I don't think it's possible I think you grow together. Okay. There's no growth. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. I, okay. I, okay. I just wanted. Wow. To that's a good that's Sunday just morning. You What's that? Uh, okay. I just feel some um, that in Proverbs 18, <laughs> verse 13, it's a it's a really a verse for all counselors and counsel people who are counseling. It says, "He that answereth." I'm sorry, King James. He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. And I think it's really important to hear out the other person and to hear all what's going on inside your own thoughts of what's going on. I, I, I do that, find that frequently when you start to talk about something. Somebody gives you an answer and they didn't get it, but they thought they did. You know? Okay. What was that verse I struggled with? Proverbs 18:13. Thank you. And um, just kind of going off what um, Jack was saying when he said there has to be a relationship, I think that's also, um, how do I put this, it's just reflective on who you're talking to. Because speaking 
of love and truth, I'm going to speak it very differently if I'm talking to my sister, than if I'm talking to my father, than if I'm talking to my best friend. Just because the relationship's a little different, but mm -hmm. also I feel, especially when, you, when I'm talking about comparing, like, talking to my best friend and talking to my father, they're at different stages in that growth. <coughs> like, my best friend's about my age, where my father is 30 plus years older. Okay, so let, let me, is it urgent? Go ahead, Jack. It's not urgent. So Jack brought up relationships. You're talking about relationships. You guys are, you guys are roaming into the, or in a good way, you're going into the kind of ideas of the how or what that looks like. But I, I want to I reel us back a little bit and show something that you guys have already touched on here regarding the dynamic in normal human relationship and communication. And then what I think that this is talking about regarding speaking the truth in love. Because again, it's it, it, it's phenomenal to me. But go ahead. So I guess I just want to like <clears throat> I, growing up and even talking to my mother on the phone now. There's things happening in her life in her church, and I said sometimes you just <clears throat> be quiet. Like you can't point out all the problems, you know. And and that ability, like Sydney said, sometimes you have to be quiet. That's not a bad thing. But she would go back to and the way I was raised. If there's sin, you have to speak up and try to stop it. And I think God is big enough to do that. So when I look at this, speak in love, I don't see that as a command. Every time you see sin, go speak in love and try to stop it. I see it when you're speaking, when you're speaking to your spouse, when you're having that conversation, that applies versus it being a command to pick out all the sin. Okay, so you just said something really important that I, I, I hope will be... Uh, highlighted or repeated in what we're talking about. You just said this idea of speaking the truth of love is not this idea of a command. And now I'm now I'm I'm, I'm free to go out there and and point out the truth that I'm because there, there's a really interesting thing that oh, I'm going to hold off with with that idea. So like pointing out truth or speaking truth, and, and so I'm going to resist that. Um, so I was just looking at it contextually. It's a departure away from what the norm is because they say we are no longer as children, right? And hey, we did that. Yeah, and Perfect. so you know we're we're caught up on how we speak to others, but it's also what we tell our what we tell ourselves. You know what we believe, which is our autonomy. You guys get that? You guys hear that? This this can't go ahead. Say it again, Ryan. All of it. <laughs> <laughs> that last part. That last, well, the, the speaking truth about, part. Yeah, the speaking truth is with all of our speech. That would be thoughts or, you know, internal and external. So it's not just about how we talk to others or how we uh, handle situations. It's what we believe and how we talk to ourselves and how we... You guys got that? It's this idea of even speaking truth to yourself. This idea of, of that, this idea that, hey, there's a transition taking place here, all right? There's this, we, just, we just ended, so the ending part of this chapter is this idea about renewal, being renewed. The beginning part of it touches on this idea of don't any longer be like little children tossed by every wind and wave of doctrine. And in it, it's, it talks about cunning, um, where is it? Here it is, cunning, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Um, what do you guys think that that's referring to? What, what do you think the idea there is? Aside from the fact that there's deceitful in there, that there's this idea of being deceived, but, but even, even being deceived, if you're thinking about being that person, like a, like a little kid, that's being blown about by every wave and wind of doctrine, or, or and that's where we talked about that last year, you know, that, that is speaking of a subjective version of the truth, okay? So the temptation there, or, or the attraction there is, hey, that's truth. So therefore, I, I'm going to believe that, I'm going to live like that, I'm going to grasp onto that. But why, why do you think there's an attraction to grasp even onto that? This idea of, a subjective idea of the truth. 
What, what's the attraction there? Okay, yes. Keep going. Well, like, the serpent was crafty and deceived them. And the tree was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So that idea of now, well, even they said to them, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So now I'm in the place of God and I get to decide what I think is right and wrong. <laughs> so, good yep, wrong. my good. My good, my decision. This is all that, all that, everything we've talked about regarding my autonomy. So this idea of craftiness and deceitful scheming, it had to do with, it, it was talking about gambling in the, in the Greek language and this idea of even, even dice. And, and I think the idea that it's talking about there is that, um, is in the old way of thinking, and we'll say, well, I want to add this too, because at the end there it says, no longer, um, it talks about, uh, no longer walk as the Gentiles. So that, uh, no longer walk as the Gentiles. Somebody have that verse right away? What are the words that follow there? If you've got it. Yep, futility. So futility of mine. What else? Darkened in their understanding, excluded from the light of God. Darkened understanding. Yes. What else? Excluded from the light of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Ignorance. All right, here, and here's what I want to highlight. This main ignorance is not just some generic ignorance like one person's dumber than the other person, all right? This ignorance is talking about what in light of everything we've talked about regarding this kingdom autonomy mentality. What is the ignorance? I mean, Jill, you just touched on it. What, Michelle? It's blindness and stone-heartedness. Blindness, hard-heartedness, Stone heartedness, all of those things is referring to the fact that I would I isolate myself, Adam and Eve. They were isolated, they were, were withdrawn voluntarily and willingly because they wanted to decide what was good for them. So now forever, not forever, sorry. Now the, the plight here on earth, and the reason why this there's even this whole concept of salvation is the fact that you and I are looking through a lens that is wrong. And that lens, primarily, as it pertains to this idea of relationship and what typically has it in, what happens in relationship, this is meant to be a, like a broken heart in, in relationship, okay? So our DNA facilitates broken relationships in this whole concept of ignorance, hard-heartedness, and broken-heartedness. And yes, I don't need to put another footnote that has everything to do with my relationship with God, but yet the proxy is here, or the, the, where we see that played out is in individual relationships. Okay, so this idea of no longer being children tossed about by every wind and, and wave of doctrine, no longer walk as the Gentiles with this kingdom autonomy mindset, because that mindset and the communication that follows is this, especially with this craftiness and deceitful scheming, is this idea that uh, it's trickery, it's cheating. And the whole point there is it's, I am trying to gain an upper hand. Okay, so now think about it, you, okay. Think about this in your relationships and how this happens in communication. I'm talking about in just, just this kind of communication. All right? From benign to extreme, benign to malignant, if I follow the same um, from not really that important to extremely important and devastating as far as how you communicate. And I promise you, all of you do this, okay? <laughs> if you don't agree with me, you need to ask the people closest to you. 
you can follow it in how you communicate with each other and the debates that ensue. Because the issue there is in our DNA, I, it, you don't, you're, it's not like you're, try, you're, you're thinking, okay, I'm going to try to gain the upper hand here you know, with this conversation with my wife, or I'm going to try, I'm going to, try to win. Hey, I'm all, I am all about winning. I love winning. It doesn't matter that the Mariners are, what, 18 games over 500. When they go on a five-game losing streak, I'm, I'm ready to ditch them already. <laughs> all right? I like winning. And that, that liking winning, and I know that's a flavor of mine, not everybody has that same flavor, so it, so it reveals itself in, in a different way. But that winning goes to even every sentence that comes out of my mouth, basically. And I'll give an example. So I, and I didn't ask Tracy if I could use this example, but she's not here. Um, <laughs> it, it was just a, this, and this is just a really an innocent example, but you know, she was over, I think it was Thursday, at the Ladies Bible Study, um, I came home early, and um, I, I had said something about, hey, I, I think I asked her, I made the statement that Jeff, Jeff had not seen the finished concrete work, specifically talking about the, uh, the basketball hoop that we put in. And she immediately went, oh, yeah, he has. Yeah, he did. And, and now, I, I mean, immediately it was like, uh, you know, we, there was this little conversation that I'll have to talk to her about this afterward. I mean, I'll talk to her again about this, but... <laughs> I, I felt a tug of war going on. Now we're in a tug of war. And it didn't, it didn't go into anything serious. We kind of laughed it off and kind of went, oh, ha, ha. But in my mind, she thought she was right. And in my mind, I thought I was right. Who was right? She was right. <laughs> I even asked Jeff the other day, hey, did, did you see the basketball hoop? And he goes, well, yeah. And I go, no, I don't mean the one that I rolled on. It's the, it, you know, so I even, did, I was trying to, he goes, yeah, I saw it. Dang it. Oh, again. Um, but there was a tug of war. At least in my mind, there was a tug of war. But that's, it's good. I mean, that was the curse. The curse is that our relationships with each other and with God. And so we were going to, the woman and the man that were made for each other are now in conflict. <laughs> and I'm going to say that's the same thing that plays out in every relationship, not yeah, just the marriage that's, context. That's the flesh that we are in now. That's so, exactly right. So we, I mean, that's where humanity lives, is conflict. And now as those that can walk in the Spirit, we can overcome that in the Spirit through Christ, through the Holy Spirit. But then if we allow the flesh, then that's where we write, we're right back to that flesh that rises up and says, I must, you know, submit my... Or, uh, you know, exercise my authority. That battle we have. Well, I think what's interesting for me because <coughs> as you went through this, <coughs> I would say my flesh went. Oh, I don't really do that. You know, I mean, I can think of, and what I went, immediately went to was other relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and I think the flesh is so pernicious that. It plays on our ignorance of what it actually does and what it actually is. And we think, man, we're not doing that. I'm not living in the flesh, but I am. Real quick story. Yesterday, I'm in uh, Spokane. I, I can see a guy <coughs> from junior high school. But we have continued to have somewhat of a relationship. So he's kind of got my personality, and we're joking back and forth. And as I look <coughs> at it, I'm thinking... We're trying to see who's got the best witty comeback. I mean, as I look at it, now, in retrospect, you know, I just thought we were having fun then, but I can see this, oh, he got this one in, so I came back with that one, and it was actually stories that I told Laura. You know, yeah, he said this, so I said that, and he said this, and I said that. <clears throat> and it's the flesh. Because I'm going to be wittier than he is. And, I, and I, I don't know why I'm, I thought about saying this. I guess with you saying, hey, you know, initially you thought, ah, that's not really what, what I do. Of course, I, I would tell you, in 100% of the marriage conversations I've had with two people, like in the counseling setting, what I experience and what I observe and what I know to be true in my own marriage is this is what happens in communication. This is why I, have, I draw this is that our flesh, our tendency is to, to justify, 
defend, attack. What else do I have? Build up my position. You guys, any any other things you want me to put in there? Break down. Break down? As in, break down what? The other position. Okay. Build up my position. Tear down. Okay. Anything else? No, that sums up the, your desire will be for your husband and he shall rule over you. So that was not the ideal. You know. But here, here's the deal. For those of you that think that, hey, you're kind of over this or this doesn't really happen, again, you need to ask your, the closest people to you because the tendency is this stuff is still going on, especially when you tie it to, when you tie it to, where do I put it? I thought I wrote truth. When you tie it to little t, truth, that's this wind, of, wind and wave of every doctrine. I, I'm going to grasp, I'm going to leverage anything that I think is true for my advantage. And here's the interesting thing, especially this last week, I'll get to you in a minute, Ryan, with, with, the, with these friends of mine that I'm meeting with. Guess what each of them believe? Each of them believes that they are right. And so guess what your, your there and your arguments or debates are, are, uh, are trying to do? You're trying to prove your right and tear down their, build up my view, tear down theirs. And in the process of that communication, you're never even hitting the heart of the issue. You're not, even, you're not even really talking about what, what really needs to be talked about. This is so interesting. I'm in these conversations, and these people are debating about this, and then they say something else, and they're debating about this, and they're, and they're missing the whole point. I see this in every conversation, well, not every conversation in my household, but it's interesting that he uses no longer be children. Because, I mean, those of you that have young children right now, and that are in the midst of this, or can remember... And guess what, the, guess what the debates are all the time at my house? Who's right? Who's right? They both think that they're right, and now it's just either who can yell the loudest, or who can, you know, give the, the biggest truckload of, you know, dump truckload that they can back up to, of proof, but you never get anywhere. The voice I found in verse 2, um, with all humility. I mean, if you do that, you can't argue with anybody. So, and here, here's what, so you, if you do that, you can't argue. So now, oh, go ahead, you had something to say. Yeah, that uh, when you do that, you don't even realize you're doing it. Like uh, when Tracy said <clears throat> that Jeff has seen it right away, immediately, that happens so often, and the people that are wrong, like in your case, you were wrong, you feel bad about it because you feel that she's battling you. And she didn't mean anything wrong. She didn't even realize it when she said it. And that's what happens to all of us. It's interesting that you say that, too, because, you know, let's say, yeah, that triggered me somehow to where she immediately says, hey, Jeff saw it. And, of course, immediately I'm going, wait a minute. Now, okay, now we got a, we got a tug of war going on. I recognize what's going on in my heart. Um, hey, that's still indicative of the, this, this situation right here and this yeah. dynamic, okay? So how could you, as soon as you said that, put on the mind of humility? Oh, I, I, there's a, I could do all kinds of lists of that, but that only heaps know, burden. That only heaps burden on a person where you say, hey, how should this? No, I know, but the flesh immediately, you know, so that's what the thing is. Like, the flesh immediately that's right. Up and so I want to show you what Paul's talking about here. To where saying with all humility and gentleness and meekness, thinking highly more of the others and showing forbearance. And so. But I think that also is when it comes um, about speaking the truth in love. Uh huh. You know, she was telling the truth, but it wasn't the fact that she said that he already seen it. It's the fact of how she responded to you immediately, and like in UK, she was thinking that she was like uh, uh, in a battling mood or whatever. You know, I think that's where it refers to speaking the truth in love. If she has said, oh, 
what do you think? Well, whatever. But you know, a different response, a kind of, in a kind of way. Although she didn't mean it wrong. So back to Ephesians to kind of reel, reel ourselves in because I got I got we got ten minutes right now. Go ahead, Ryan. I just want to throw a term out there because it kind of ties everything together, and this is ignorance of true peace in pursuit of what we believe peace to be. All of those things are self-serving and going after what we feel will bring a peaceful resolution. In okay, so again, what I'm hearing you say, and, and that's a little P. Yeah, yeah, what we're doing here is bringing about, and we've talked about this, about the human definition or version of peace. Okay, and, and what's going on here, I, I'm actually, I'm trying to acquire a certain kind of peace. Is that what you're saying? Right. And yeah. That, and that's what I, when done out of ignorance, because there's no understanding that there's a better peace. Well, that's what the goal is. When he says the unity, be diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit, and then further down the goal is until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature, perfect man. I mean, that's the end result. And so we keep that as our focus, the unity of peace and the unity of the spirit with humility. So Then it's hard to have arguments. <clears throat> so hard to have... So here, here's how that's hard to have, because what I kind of what I'm hearing from people is, hey, we can dive into the kind of the the eaches of like how, for instance, Michelle saying, well, what should I, you know, how could I have responded, or what should I have responded, which can be a decent uh, conversation to say, hey, well, what you know, what could have happened there to to, and again, it didn't end up in an argument; it was just fine. But you know, what what could have been different? That can be helpful, but what I think Paul is doing, he's not, he's not, I don't think he's pointing us to those situations and saying, okay, now let's try to analyze and break down all of these different circumstances and figure out how we could or should do that. What does humility look like in that? Yeah. What is, what is long suffering? Because I, again, I think that what he's talking about is actually pointing to, uh, pointing to something that Ryan was talking about here, that this has more to do with you rather than, than them and the outward activity that, it, that reveals itself. And it has to do with a bigger perspective. Okay? And the bigger perspective, and, and but I believe the overwhelming evidence in Ephesians is this, is that any time this word truth is used, it is only referring to one thing. In other words, it is not referring to what you're determining is true about the situation. Peace does not come from what you think is true about the situation. I said this before, because often, I forget where this was earlier in Ephesians, but often, oh, it was the Philippians passage where it says, think on these things, whatever is true, whatever is, you know, whatever is in that whole list of things, okay? That is not talking about, I, I can't, that is not talking about you going, okay, hey, uh, Jeff, Help me understand what is true, little t, about my situation. It is talking about what is truth, all caps, thousands of exclamation points, what is truth about God that transcends your situation. Okay, so this is the huge perspective. We keep getting mired in, and it's very easy to get distracted by the situation. And I will tell you, this whole idea, you know, the peace of God which surpasses understanding, the peace, the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This idea where he's talking about the unity, the, uh, the unity of the body. So Ephesians 2, 3 talks about the enmity and this, this dynamic that we know is the, is the human heart. And, and, and he gives an extreme version of that in the sense that Jew and Gentile hate each other their relationship is torn apart, and it's, it's futile. It is hopeless. And he says, like we said, it's a different kind of peace. God isn't just trying to go, hey, let's figure out how to, let's figure out how to mitigate this and make this softer, or to where there's just no flare-ups like a human would do. God says what, Ryan? 
What does God do? He creates the two into one. Right. He is taking two extreme haters of each other and haters of God, and he's saying, you know what? I'm going to create unity with two new people, and you're going to be one. And so this idea of creating the two into one is a, is a, is a different kind of peace. It's a different, it creates a different kind of hope. And it's extreme, okay? So what I put in my notes is I said God is, God is preserving. It's in the form of a command to us at the beginning. He says, therefore now, walk in a manner worthy of the calling of which you've been called. And he says this idea of preserving the, the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. God, um, unity of the Spirit. Through the bond of peace. And then the truth that he shows, at least, at, if, you, if you take that list right there, of course, I'm gonna put I'm gonna put the cross. Because this is always the basis for truth, any kind of truth that Paul is talking about. So he points to the truth. Christ, this idea of the unity of what he says there's one, and what does he list? There's one what? Body. One body. Yep. One hope of your calling. Uh huh. One Lord. One faith. One baptism. One God and Father of all. With overall, through all, and in all. Just to clarify, that's all. So you know what he does? He points to that and he says, "You know what? We've already we've already seen in chapter two. He says you're." This is what he did. You guys were dead in your trespasses and sins. And guess what God did? He made you alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Because of his great love. All of those things. He, you've been made alive. You've been adopted as sons and daughters. You are no longer this. And he goes, you know what the truth is? I've established what the truth is. There's, you don't any longer have to debate about what the truth is. Or what good is. Or what not good is. So you no longer have to look through the lens of you anymore. It's interesting. When you guys talked about at the beginning, the idea of speaking truth and love. Do you know, do you know what I, at least what I, why I put these notes down? Do you know what perspective this is from? This is from my perspective about the other person. None of it had to do with me Desperate in my need for Christ, in a state of desperation of help, looking at the truth that I need His grace, He's pouring out my grace, so now what does speaking truth and love look like in light of that? That long list of, um, at the beginning of chapter 4, uh, where, where He says, Walk in a manner worthy of, all, uh, worthy of the calling with which you've been called, with all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to... To maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. You guys, this is all, all of this stuff now is the truth. God has established unity, he's, and he's preserving unity, and he's building unity as a result of what he's doing in you and, and other people. And that is what the basis of, especially as we looked at the, uh, the, the verse in Philippians, is this idea of, through with all prayer and petition, Again, what was the idea of prayer and petition? Begging. begging. What? Begging. Money. Begging. Desperate. Cry for help. I need help. He is the helper. Now we can say we need help. We are the created beings. He is the helper. And basically, that idea of humility, gentleness, long-suffering, tolerance. Is there anything else? Kindness. Again, remember how we talked about the upside-down king? 
the idea of the, the kingship of Christ, it's upside down. He, he comes as a servant. He comes with humility. Yes, we have the, the circumstances in which we see Christ pointing out blatant hypocrisy of, of, the, of the Pharisees. Yes, we see that. And the overwhelming action and activity of Jesus to other people was characterized by what? Grace. Grace, patience, kindness, humility. I would say that Jesus' reaction to the Pharisees were a result of them coming to him and saying things and asking and accusing and then him saying, hey, look, this is... He, he, was, he, was, he the only person, could proclaim the truth about their heart and say it with gentle, gentleness and humility and compassion. So that, that what changes here is this is about we, especially as you look at that, that top part of that verse where it says, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint which, is, which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Build up in love. See, so no longer are we taking things to have an advantage, to prop myself up. The humility comes from me recognizing I need help. And like Ryan even said, hey, this is about me. In kind of an upside down, backward sense. And that any time I come and talk, and this is where I didn't get to the the other pieces where we're talking about, you know, what is the real need of humans that we've talked about so often? What is it, Jeff? Uh, I'm not sure exactly where you're going, but uh, rescue. I mean, I, I... Connection. They want to hear. They want to be heard. The irony is this facilitates isolation, withdrawal. This is something different. In which unity actually creates relationship. In which a person is connected with other people and connected with God in a way that is impossible with this DNA. And so when we get to this piece, at the end of this chapter, we're talking about be renewed. Renewing your minds, again, has everything to do. It's just a repetition of everything we keep talking about. Jeff? I was going to say, uh, so when Jill and I have our arguments... That's an experience. Jill saying that never happens. So when we do, I mean, we're experiencing the conflict, the division, because we're believing our lower case T, T truth, and we're fighting for that. And, and there's this gracious invitation from God. Sometimes in the midst of it, these little subtle hints in your mind saying, "Is that really true?" And it's like God reminding us, drawing us back to the capital T truth, which is to look at the already love people, accepting people. You're experiencing something you don't have to experience because you believe in life. You're in the darkness. And so it's neat to think of that capital T truth, even though we don't always experience it, and sometimes some of the experience is actually true. And yeah. Well, and I would say, I would say it's virtually impossible to try to protect yourself from getting to there. I think the opportunity is, in the midst of that happening, God gives us the awareness that it's happening. And now it's the invitation to go, okay, hold on, wait a minute. I don't have to debate about my truth anymore. What I think is right or wrong here anymore. How do we remind ourselves of the truth so that... I can be humble, not just humble in the way I'm talking, but I can go, wait a minute, does this even really matter? we got to stop. Let me pray. Dear Lord God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your love. I thank you for the beautiful weather and the relationships that you've provided for us in you and in and with and through other people. In Jesus' name I pray.